Hi, it's Robin. I've got here a little demo moving a sprite under joystick control. Actually, I have a more complicated program involved that's all ready to go, but it was going to take like forever to explain the basics and then that program as well. So we're going to save that for a second video. I'll show you how I made this little example and uh, there's quite a bit even, even to this. But before we get into that, you'll notice I got my 64C here. I actually bought this, uh, I don't know how many years ago, a while ago, for $2.99. I'll show the before picture. It was kind of grungy, but it works perfectly. I cleaned it up, and uh, here it is now. I haven't used a 64C on my channel before. I've had the Breadbin 64 in the first few episodes, then the 128D, flat 128, and here's a 64C. And also, just to share one comment I got here. This is from Daniel Fred. Hello, I am an ancient cracking group coder. I think that what you are doing is wrong because everyone has to learn by himself the machine system for his own. You are creating lamers, in my opinion. I think Daniel's now deleted his comment because he got a bit of flack for that one. So we'll get on with creating some more lamers. So I'm going to start with basic again to show about reading the joystick and displaying some sprites. As always, there will be an index in the description below, so if you want to skip ahead to the assembly language part, go for it. The simplest program that I could think of to read the joystick, just print peak location 56320, which is joystick import to, and then go to 10. And this will simply read the current joystick value and display it on the screen. 127 is all the lower seven bits of the register are set. Might be surprising, but on the Commodore 64, when you don't push any direction or buttons, it registers a one in the bit, and it's a zero if only if it's closed, if you're pushing that direction. So we see 127, if you push up, that goes down to 126. That is the bit zero, which has a value of one in decimal, is being closed. And if you pull down, it goes from 127 to 125, a difference of two. Left, 127 to 123 is a difference of four. To the right is a difference of eight. And if you push the button, it goes from 127 down to 111, a difference of 16. So those are the five bits in this joystick, one for each direction, up, down, left, right, and then one for the fire button. And here's another little program I wrote that might make this more clear. Simple little basic program. And it's just printing the values in binary. So at the top are the numbers seven through zero. That's the bits, the number of the bits. And below is their current value. So if you look at bit zero, it's currently a one. If I push up, it becomes a zero. It's a slow program because it's written in basic, takes a while to respond. Down changes bit one to a zero, bit two left. Whoop, I did the diagonal there. And bit three is a zero. And finally the fire button, bit four. And you can do combinations of those. Like if I push up, I push left, that changes bits zero and two. And the fire button is bit four. And just to look at that program, it's uh, this just prints the bit numbers at the top of the screen and then goes to the top left corner and does a loop from seven to zero, step negative one, counting downwards because we go from the high bit on the left all the way down to the low bit on the right. We peak the value of the joystick register and we do a logical AND with two to the power of X. So for bit zero, that becomes one. For bit one, that becomes two. For bit two, that becomes four. One, two, four, eight, sixteen. If the value of AND is equal to that bit value, this is a truthfulness statement like we examined a few episodes ago. Uh, well, back during the VIC-20 episode, I think it was. And the negative flips. If it's a true value, it changes from negative one. This will change it to a positive one. So anyway, that's a little program you can experiment with. 
That's reading the joystick in a nutshell. I'll try a little program here to display a sprite. This is about the simplest program I can think of. The Commodore 64 Programmer's Reference Guide uses this convention of V equals 53248, which is the base of the VIC chip, the video chip, the VIC-2. I'll stick with that. This is setting the sprite definition as the sprite shape to position zero, which is not normally what you would do, but this is just for the example. I'll, I'll change it later. Then we'll poke V plus 21 which is the register for enabling the sprites. So we're going to turn on sprite zero by poking a one in there. And we'll absolutely have to do this, but we'll set the color of the sprite to one. When you turn on the Commodore 64, all the VIC registers are initialized automatically by the kernel and it's actually set to one, but it's good practice, of course, to set the color. And then finally, to sh make sure that the sprite appears on screen, we'll just set sprite zero's X coordinate to location 100 and the Y coordinate also to 100. Okay, and if we run that program, there, an ugly sprite will appear. But it is a sprite. You'll notice that's rendered by the hardware and we can actually move the cursor and it doesn't interfere with that sprite at all. We can expand a sprite with poke register 23 makes the sprite taller and register 29 expands it in the X direction. Okay, so you can get a better look at the sprite. You see, this is, this is an ugly sprite. And you see how it's kind of, there's all these pixels flashing around this area here. Yeah, that's because this sprite, the VIC, is actually displaying zero page memory right here, when we poked 2040,0, that told the VIC to look at location 0 in memory. Zero page in the operating system, when BASIC is running, is actually a very busy place with some memory locations frequently changing. So that's what we get a look into it here. We're actually peering into memory. We can point at some other locations. So for example, instead, if we looked at, we could look at location 2 here. Well, you saw something changed when I entered, hit return. We run that. Now we're looking at sprite definition two. And to find out where memory that is, you just multiply it by 64. So it's actually location 128 in the middle of zero page now. There's some kind of timer running right around here. You can see how it's doing a binary, looks like a 16-bit counter. Another interesting one is Sprite Definition 7, which is going to be part of the stack. You can see that as we use the computer, or as we're using the basic and the operating system, it's modifying memory there. And one last one. 10, this is now part of basic workspace here. And as we move the cursor, it's updating a number of locations that track the basic screen editor. Just thought you'd find that a bit of an interesting insight into how the VIC and the computer share memory. Okay, so the place that we, when we're just messing around basic, a good place to store a sprite is actually definition 13. And that's in memory at 13 times 64. Each sprite definition is 64 bytes long. Well, it's actually 63 bytes, but they've aligned it to 64 bytes. There's one byte unused. What a waste. Okay, so that's location 832. So let's just run that. So now you see the sprite has disappeared. That's because this part of memory is currently blank. And what we can do is just poke, or actually we'll do a for loop, for x equals 832 to 832 plus 62. That's a total of 63 bytes. And we're going to poke location x with 255. 
and next and just watch that space where there the sprite used to be there and it's poked that sprite into memory I actually saw it draw out because of how slow basic is you can watch it plot those pixels the way it works is there's three bytes per line times 21 rows or three bytes across each byte is 8 bits, so you actually have 24 pixels across and 21 down. And we could just modify a spot there like 833, that's the second byte. We'll zero it out so that at the top of the sprite, there should be a chunk, the middle bit missing. There. Three bytes beyond that is one row down. So we'll just poke 836 with zero, and we'll take another piece out of it. So you could actually live poke your sprite into memory and fiddle with it there. Today we're just going to be using squares. Nothing wrong with fancier sprites, but that's going to take even more time. This video is going to be long already. Okay, so we'll just stick that on line 25. So there's our program so far, which just displays a square sprite on the screen. Let's try it just to make sure it's good. Yeah, there we go. We'll just leave the X, the X and Y expansion off for now. Okay, and now we're going to expand this program. So instead of poking directly into the VIC registers for the sprite position, we're going to set variable X and Y to 100. And that's going to be our sprite coordinates. We'll store them in variables instead of directly in the VIC register. Line 40, we're just going to read in peak 56320 into the variable J for joystick. And then we can just do some logical comparisons here, like if j and 1, that is bit 0, which has a value of 1, equal to 0, then that means the joystick is being moved up. And therefore, we want to decrease y. This up here is lower numbers for sprites, and this is higher. So we actually want to go to go up the screen, we want to decrement y. And we'll just do variations of this. Line 60 is going to be j and 2. And this is for going downwards. So we'll modify it to plus 1 using that Commodore screen editor. And if j and 4 is 0, then we want to go left. They're holding down left. So x equals x minus 1. And finally, line 80, if j and 8, then x equals x plus 1. Okay, so that handles checking each bit and then moving the, well, then modifying the sprite variables. I'm going to do another line here. If j and 16 just to check the joystick button is zero. Then we're going to poke 53280, which is the border color with peak. Sorry about the wrap there. 53280 plus one. And we're going to end it with 255 just so that as we increase the border color, each time the button's pressed, we're going to increase the border color and this automatically handles it wrapping around. Actually, we can even just end it with 15, because there's only 16 valid colors anyway. Just I just thought of that now. We're just going to go x equals x and 255. I'm putting spaces in here for legibility, even though it slows down the program a little bit. And y equals y and 255. And this just makes sure that we don't generate an illegal value if we go too far left or right or up or down that n255 keeps that value at a maximum of 255 and a minimum of zero okay and now we're just going to simply poke the sprite zero x register with the value in the x variable and y the sprite zero y register with the value in y now right now we're kind of cheating because it's actually a 9-bit x value the maximum value is up to 511 
9 bits. But we're not going to deal with that right now. We will deal with that later in this episode. 120, and then we will go to 40. All right, and let's see if this works. There's our sprite. And we're going to very slowly move to the right. This is basic. After all, this is why you don't write a video game in basic. And there, it wrapped around again. And we can do the same going up. Should wrap around to the bottom. There it is. Okay, so that's all the basics of reading the joystick and displaying a sprite on the screen, moving it under joystick control. Now we're going to write that in assembly language. So I've got my Super Snapshot cartridge plugged in, as I often do. And I'm going to load up Turbo Macro Pro from my micro IEC card. It's like an SD2 IEC. This one's made by Jim Brain, but there's also the Future Was 8-Bit has an interesting one that has a cute little case. I don't have one of those yet. We're just going to use the version of Turbo Macro Pro that does not require a RAM expansion unit. So for this one, just do sys32768. Okay, and if you're loading this off the D64, I'm going to provide down in the description below. This back arrow load, and it should be... Uh, this current version is simple too. If I update this before I release it, uh, then just look for the latest file name version. So it's just back arrow, which is tilde on your emulator, and the L for the load command. Type in your file name. Okay, so we'll walk through this program. It's about 50 lines of code. And I'm just trying to keep it as close to the basic original as possible. So I'm going to be using more decimal numbers than maybe I usually would. Or maybe that you're comfortable with. But hey, we can use decimal, we can use hex, we can use binary. Whatever suits us at the time. Okay, so we're going to set V to 53248. This is a label. It's not actually a variable. It's just a shorthand for this memory location. It doesn't set aside any memory. It is just a shorthand for 53248, which is also perhaps more famously known as D1000. I don't know if it's famous. <laughs> That's the location of the VIC chip in memory. And then we're just going to do this directive here, telling the assembler we want to assemble to location 4000. Nothing particularly special about that. It's just a convenient place in memory today. These four lines are totally optional. They are setting the NMI vector to location 32768, which is where Turbo Macro Pro is located in memory. And it's just a neat shortcut that whenever we hit the restore key, it will automatically bring up Turbo Macro Pro again. I showed that in a previous episode. Here, we're just using the kernel print routine with Petsky code 147, which is to clear the screen. It's not really necessary, but it tidies things up. Okay, here we're going to be setting the sprite pointer again to 13, to sprite definition 13, and storing that in 2040. I neglected to mention before that the sprite pointers, rather than being in the VIC chip, they are actually the sprite definition pointers. They are located in screen memory in the unused, otherwise unused, eight bytes at the very end of video memory. Video memory is the, this, like what we're looking at here, it's 1000 characters, which is made of 40 columns across, 25 rows down, 40 times 25 is 1000, but screen memory is a full kilobyte, 1024 bytes, so there's actually 24 unused bytes, and those final eight are used as sprite pointers. It's kind of an interesting design decision, uh, which has some pluses and some minuses. So if you do change screen memory, which we're not going to do in this episode, it actually changes where the sprite pointers are as well. So this is not always where sprite zero's definition is, but it is where the default is. Okay, and then we're going to load A with one and store that both in the sprite enable register, where sprite zero you put a 1 in there, and in Sprite Zero's color register, V plus 39, there's 8 bytes in a row here. V plus 40 is Sprite 1, V plus 41 is Sprite 2, and so on. 
and we just have a simple loop where we're going to set the X register, which is like an index register in this case, to 62, where we're just going to be poking that sprite in to memory that square <laughs> sprite definition. So we're going to set 62, which is actually at the end of the sprite, load A with 255, and then we're just going to be essentially poking 255 into the sprite definition at 832. We already explained all this in the basic program. The X register is added on to location 832. So on the first pass, it's going to be 62 plus 832. So that's location 894. It's going to put 255 in there, which is all bits on. Then we're going to decrement X. And as long as the number is positive, we're going to loop. When it decrements all the way down to zero and then one more, it goes to FF or 255 decimal. This number is no longer positive because the high bit has been set. So it will stop looping and our sprite has been defined. If you want fancier looking sprites, then you could store them in your source code and then read them in and store them into memory here. We'll do that another time. Okay, and then we've got a loop. I'm just going to call it forever. And that's the label I always use for my main loop because it's going to loop forever, at least until the computer dies or you reset it. We're going to load location 56320, which is the joystick port that we were peaking in basic. Now, this isn't the most efficient way of writing this routine, but it's the closest parallel to basic. And for your understanding, this is probably the best way to do it first. And next time I do an episode about this, I'll show you another method that is uh, superior, but I think more difficult to understand. So we're just going to load in the register. We're going to end it with one, which masks out all the bits except the lowest one. If it's not equal to zero, that means that the joystick has not been pushed up. So therefore we're just going to jump ahead to down. But if it has been, we're going to decrement the sprite y uh, variable or memory location that we define down at the bottom of this program. I'll show you that in a bit. So basically that just, if you push up, then we're going to decrease sprite y. That's the same as when we were going y equals y minus one in basic. Either way, we're going to go ahead to down. Again, load the memory location and check it for the next bit, which is two to the power of one or two. If it's not equal, go ahead to check the left direction. Otherwise, increment sprite y. That's y equals y plus 1. And on we go. Loading it, checking for bit 4. 2 to the power of 2 is 4. This is bit 2, and that's for going left. And we're going to decrement sprite x to make it go left. x equals x minus 1. And again, 8. This is 2 to the power of 3. Bit 3 is the right direction, and that would increment it. And finally, we're going to check for 2 to the power of 4, which is 16, for the button direction. And if the button is not pushed, we're done. If it is pushed, then we are going to increase the border color. That's also the same as DO20, which I think we used in another episode. Okay, and if we're done, then we're just going to load our sprite x value in and store it in v, which is the actual hardware location for the sprite zero x coordinate in the VIC, and likewise for y. And then we're going to jump forever, which just goes back up here again. And down here is those two variables, so to speak, the memory locations where we're going to store the x location, and we're predefining that to location 100, and y. And now there's a comma zero here. That's because right after we run this, we're going to make a few modifications to improve it. And that'll come in handy. That's going to be the ninth bit of the sprite x coordinate. So back arrow three to compile, and then press S to start. And there's our sprite. <laughs> and well, you might think there's a bug here. 
but this is actually just how fast assembly language is compared to that basic program. That's actually me moving left. I don't know how it looks to you, but on the monitor here, it almost looks more like I'm moving to the right. And that's to the right. You see how the sprites are actually tearing, if that's getting picked up properly by my video capture. And that's because the sprites are moving to the right as the screen is being redrawn. <laughs> that's if I try to go on diagonals. If I press the fire button, see what it does to the border color there. It's changing the border color so rapidly that it is a mess. It almost looks like, I don't know, like plaid or something there. Okay. So I think that's a very good illustration of how fast assembly language is. I will press restore to pop back in. So the first thing we're going to fix is just to go up to this forever loop. And at the top of each loop, we're going to load a with, well, again, FF or 255 decimal and compare that with the raster counter that we've looked at in previous episodes. And if it's not equal, we're going to go to back to forever. A back arrow, delete, by the way, to delete a line. Okay, and that should slow things down nicely. It's going to wait for scan line 255 each time through the loop. And now we'll try this. There, that's a much more reasonable speed. One thing that's not completely clear here, I think I'm going to change the border color. Load A with number three, cyan. Okay, just to make it clear, when we move left here, you see how we're appearing mid-screen. If we move right, see how we just pop back around? That's because we're not dealing with that ninth bit. The X register, if we're only dealing with eight bits, it can only go up to maximum location of 255, but the C64 screen is 320 pixels wide plus over scan. Okay, so we will fix that. There's also this problem of how the sprites just wrap around. We're not going to deal with that today. Uh, that involves 8 or 16-bit comparisons and more, more math that I'll have to get into another time. So solutions for the ninth bit. Okay, so when we are moving to the right, where we're incrementing the sprite x value, this is only an 8-bit. We're just adding 1 to the 8-bit value. So when you do an increment, if it wraps around from 255 or FF to zero, that will set the zero flag, which we can detect with this branch, if not equal. If it is not equal to zero, then we can go ahead to button. But if it is equal to zero, then we should also increment sprite X plus one. So that's the, the high byte of the X location. And likewise, when we're going left, we are decrementing Sprite X. So we want to detect when we go from zero further left, and it wraps around to 255 decimal or FF hex. Unfortunately, there isn't just a simple flag we can check for that. So we just need a little bit more work. So we have to actually load the Sprite X value into the A register and compare it with FF to see if it wrapped. If it didn't, then we just go ahead to checking to the right. And otherwise, we are going to decrement sprite x plus 1. It's just, this is a very simple version. If you're actually writing a game, you may not want them to always move one pixel at a time. So that would involve fractional math, which again is a topic for another video sometime. Okay, and then finally, we now have this ninth bit, but we actually have to make use of it. We have to display it. And now this is a terrible hack. We're going to do this 
just because this episode is getting long enough already, we're just going to load the high byte of the Spray X position and store it right in the register that keeps track of the ninth bit of all X sprites. So I'm going to put here shift lock. This is horrible. Okay. I don't want you to come away from this thinking this is the best way of doing it. Next time I deal with this topic, I'm going to show you a much better, more robust solution. This is only <laughs> workable because we're only using one sprite at a time. This register actually has the high bit of all eight sprites packed into one register. And so we're actually, <laughs> if we were using more than one sprite here, this would break things terribly. So I just want to stress, this is horrible. It works in this situation. And because of how, how long things are going already, we're just going to do this simple solution. Start. And here we go. We'll go right. We'll go right. Does it wrap around? Yay. Okay. And that's going all the way up to 512 there. It wraps around again. One thing I didn't mention yet is that this is actually... When you're up in this top left corner, this is not location 00, zero it is actually location X48 and Y equals 50, I believe. I hope I have that right. Uh, I'll put the correct numbers in the, in the corner. And that's so that sprites can actually smoothly go on and off the screen, like to hide behind the borders. If you couldn't do that, otherwise the sprites would be here. If you tried to go left, they would instantly snap over to the other side or whatever. So that's the reason why the sprites have kind of a weird coordinate system. Okay, and just a preview here, this is the program I originally wrote for this episode, but it ended up being all oh, 308 lines long and <laughs> explaining this without explaining <laughs> and explaining everything I already dealt with this episode was just going to get ridiculous. So just so you can see what you have to look forward to, you can move each sprite around. If you press the number keys, we're going to show you how to read the keyboard. You press number two, it moves sprite, the second sprite, three, and so on. They're all movable, one through eight. If you press the fire button, it changes the color of the active sprite. And if you type a letter on the key, that D, I'm moving there. If I press A, that's an A, press Z. So it's got all the letters here. So anyway, I'll be going through that program and sharing the source code. Okay, so look down in the description. I'll have some links to a download and probably some recommended other reading or whatever. Appreciate it. Thanks for all the feedback about you enjoying these tutorial videos. I thought the one about playing music was going to be niche and that turned out got like 12 or 13,000 views, which was very solid. <laughs> so thanks for your support. If you haven't already subscribed, please do. If you know anyone who would like to watch my videos who you think isn't yet, please do share them. And I really appreciate each one of you watching, commenting, and so on. Okay, thanks for watching. We'll talk to you next time.